Now, having seen the index calculus attacks, we actually reached a stopping point where we can take a look back at all the things we have seen so far and look at, hey, well, what do we know about the group analysis? What sizes can we recommend or what sizes do other people recommend for using these systems? Because, I mean, we always have these parameters running around. We have, for instance, for the symmetric key size, uh, how large should the key size be? Or we just looked at fine field discrete log systems. How large does the prime have to be? How large does the subgroup have to be? So what I'm showing you here is the recommendation from the ECOP CSA, Algorithms, Key Sizes and Protocols report from 2018. Uh, you can also go to keylength.com where you're getting um, in an interactive format where you can select different sources for those. Here I'm following, well, that report and using Q for denoting the size of the subgroup. So in the lecture, I've always used L, that report ended up using Q. So Q is a prime which divides P minus one. So let me jump at the fine fields because, well, that's the topic of this unit we're currently in. Um, when you're balancing the, um, the costs of everything, so we know that for the group size, we're having these generic attacks running in the scrolled of the group size. So if you're looking at the size of the group, so then the group, this log base P, uh, log base two of Q, that has to have at least enough bits so that the scrolled of two to that number is as large as the attack cost. And we typically assume that the attacker has two to the 128 operations. That is, this is generous, we don't know any attacker who can do this, but well, that's exactly what we want to have, that we can defend attackers which are not possible. Um, like I see the column there, I still left it in there because the report has it, but that assumes 2 to the 80 for the attacker and 2 to the 80 is doable. So this is, um, this is not a secure choice, so you should not be with systems in this column. You should be in the systems with this column or if you want, you can go for the next color. Now, what we're seeing there for symmetric keys is pretty easy story. So if you want to have that the attacker takes to the 128 operations, and we're looking at symmetric key, key sizes, we're taking 128 bits for the key size. So exactly the same size that the security level is we're taking for the key size. So that means we only want to use systems where the best attack is basically a brute force attack. Then for hash functions, we know that we have um, the scroll attacks for the collision finding. So finding pre images and second pre images takes time 2 to the m for m bit outputs, but collisions take only 2 to the m over 2. And so if we want to defend against attackers who can do 2 to the 128, then we have to choose m to be 256, so twice the size. Um, Max, uh, max, so message authentication codes is a different story. So even though many of those use the hash function by the way that they're put together, for instance, we have seen the poly1305 um, construction, those can be again working with 128 bit keys. So the output size and the key size for the symmetric key, uh, 128 bits. If you need a hash function, you should choose 256 bits and up. RSA, I'd shown you um, the number field SIF as a sub-exponential algorithm, and so if you take 3,000 bit keys and up, so PGP allows you to go up to 4,000 bits, so this is a good size uh, for the, well, near term, I mean, it's a good size for now. Find fields. So this is where we interest, uh, interesting stuff happens right now. So this report is putting the difficulty of the number field SIF for factoring at about the same as the number field SIF for discrete logs. And as I said, these are comparable. Um, story used to be that we're thinking that the RSA problem is a bit easier to solve, for instance, the matrix is more two. On the other hand, there have been lots of improvements to the fine field case. So if you're having the P to the N, where N is not one, actually you probably have to use somewhat larger systems. But anyway, you're seeing that those are quite imbalanced. So the subgroup has to have 256 bits. That's just against uh, scroll attacks. But for the field size, you have to embed this into something much, much larger. And that is because these index calculus attacks run in sub-exponential time. 
follow the curves, we don't know any such things, so that it's just a matter of what the group size is, and the group size has to have, well, twice as many bits as the security level. So that's easy again. And then there's another row which is called pairing, and I'll actually get to that in the next unit when we talk about somewhat more advanced systems. So a pairing is a map between elliptic curves and finite fields, and so you have to satisfy all the criteria. You again work in the subgroup, and so that's like the security of an ECDLP or the fine field security for the Q, so the size of the subgroup has to be at least 256 bits. But then you're working in some fine field, and if you look here, there's an extra parameter K coming in. This will be the embedding degree, that's the parameter that comes in as pairings. Um, just keep in mind that the fine field you're working over is FP, uh, with some potential FP to the N, and there's also a parameter K, and this fine field here that is again a, a target for index calculus attack. I'm not necessarily a fan about this column here because, yes, for symmetric key, I agree that the long term uh, you might want to go up with the key sizes. But if long term is really, really long term, I don't think we're going to see anything like this large before we have a quantum computer. So I don't expect that we're having attackers who can do 2 to the 256 or that you have to protect against attackers who can do 2 to the 256 operations, uh, and we don't have a quantum computer. Now, if we have a quantum computer, it's actually far worse news, because then all of these public key systems at this table will have a, a polynomial time attack. So I'll give a short overview on post-quantum systems at the end of this lecture, not today, but in the next unit. Um, and then you'll also see that, yeah, for these systems, these entries make less sense. So this one is good choices for today. If you're building a system, you might just want to toss in larger symmetric key systems because they're typically cheap anyway, so you might as well pick those three rows for the output sizes if you have the time or the space available. All right, now some things, I have already shown you the algorithmic encryption system, so some things that are possible with fine field discrete logs that we don't have an analogous thing for elliptic curves. And there's also something which you should notice at this table, namely for elliptic curves, everything is nicely balanced, whereas for fine fields we have this huge imbalance. And normally this is kind of just annoying. But for the DSA system, which is, stands for the Digital Signature Algorithm, this was actually used in order to sort of make the signature sizes smaller. Before you get overly excited, you still need 256 bits in your, in your group order. So here I'm back to my notation. So this L is the Q from the previous slide. Um, so you work in a subgroup which is much, much smaller than the size of the field. But it's just the same size as elliptic curves. So getting something where the signature has two elements which are less than L is just getting as good as elliptic curves are anyway, without even trying. I mean, elliptic curves don't have to stretch for that, you know, they naturally do this. For finite fields, this is a great thing to make them somewhat less pathetic. Sorry, I have to do some poking here. All right, so DSA goes back to actually before NIST exists, that is, was the National Bureau of Standards, and um, they standardized the system and they also later on standardized ECDSA as a elliptic curve version of it. They didn't state any origin, they didn't say where it came from, they just said, hey, look, here's a standard. Um, it was later on shown through a FOIA request that this was actually designed by the NSA. It's a data flow which you now have seen already with ECDSA, so it won't be too weird, but historically the reason that we don't use the Schnorr protocol, which I showed you with the identification protocol and how to turn it into a signature system, is that back then Schnorr's system was patented. And so the idea in DSA was to work around this, to make the system look somewhat different so that the patent wouldn't apply. And of course, if the best system is patented, what you design in this way is not the best system. So similar to ECDSA, we again gonna pick a random nonce here. This will have all the same fragility about nonce reuse or structured nonce that you have seen in ECDSA, so that applies as well. So let me just highlight the interesting parts. In ECDSA, you're computing the kth multiple, or in, in this case, the kth power of an element, calling this R, 
And then what happens here is you take this R and you reduce it mod L. Now with elliptic curves, reducing this modular group order, or take the x-coordinate, reducing the modular group order, wouldn't be much of a difference because for elliptic curve, the P and the L are about the same size. But here, remember from the last slide that we have this huge difference, 3072 bits versus 256 bits. So reducing R mod L makes this component a lot, lot, lot smaller. And so it's sort of interesting and it wouldn't, it's not obvious how it works from the, from the arithmetic, um, that you can still work with this because, I mean, you're representing something which is the power of, of G, which is arithmetic mod P, and then you're suddenly looking at this mod L. Now, this equation we're computing always mod L, so this is the signature equation, this is where the secret key A comes in, where the hash of the message comes in, so this is the same data flow that you have seen in ECDSA, and taking the extra expense of doing the inversion here, this was this attempt about working around the Schnorr patent. And so what you're then sending is two elements, this R bar, which is R mod L, and S. So DSA signatures are shorter than Algamal signatures for the same setup. So you're getting both of those of size less than L. Of course, you can also do this with Schnorr, but they also managed to do it. And then the verification works again you first need to invert S mod L, and then you're computing some products, and well, it's going to be one of the exercises on the exercise sheet to show that this thing here is actually giving you a valid signature. That actually this R prime that you're computing there, so this is again a value mod P, that when you take this value mod P and you're using it mod L, gives you the same number. There are some caveats. You have to make sure that you have a unique representation for your find field. If for this computation, using a number between 0 and p minus 1, and here you're choosing a number between p minus, uh, minus p minus 1 over 2 and plus p minus 1 over 2, then chances are 50 50 that those will not agree. Okay, but that you kind of knew beforehand anyway. So DSA is in the situation of fine fields where you have the downside that your g is much, much larger, that you're dealing with 3000 bit numbers it is at least ensuring that the signature size doesn't explode. So the signature size is two elements of 256 bits rather than one element of 3072 bits and one of 256 bits. As a reminder for DS, uh, ECDSA or EDDSA, both of those have 256 bits to begin with. Okay, so time for an overview. Uh, what we have done so far is we have looked into um, currently used crypto for the public key systems and symmetric key systems. So the current used crypto, what you're looking um, at, you're looking at your at your browser, you're going to see elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. That's actually typically the preferred system. This is used for ephemeral Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So this is a one-time thing just now between you and your browser, uh, your browser and server. And the next time you're coming back, it's going to be a new key. You might also be using Diffie-Hellman diff fine fields. And unless you're using TLS 1.3, so if you want with one of the older TLS versions, you still see RSA used for uh, getting a key. What we're still seeing is, well, older standards with RSA, we're seeing NIST curves or brain pool curves. So for instance, NIST P256 is one of those curves. And then using this together with ECDSA. We have seen in this course Montgomery curves, Edwards curves, and actually there's a trend towards those curves because they are more efficient to implement and safer to implement. On the symmetric key side, this TLS, so this, this protocol behind HTTPS, that is using AS or ChaCha20 with some MAC. So, a, well, for AS, it's a mode and a MAC. So, ASGCM is a mode and a MAC at the same time. So, this is getting you authenticated symmetric key encryption. And then for the ChaCha, that's the stream cipher, you're doing ChaCha Poly 1305. I had already linked to that RFC on the, on the web page. So high-end devices which have hardware support for AS will typically use this, whereas if you have a smartphone or something, then you're looking at ChaCha 20 Poly 1305. So in general, well, it's getting better, and you have in this course seen the modern versions of everything. 
of course, well, there is still a lot to be done. So there are bugs, there are untrustworthy hardware. And unfortunately, there's even politics getting in our way. So crypto is a always interesting field. Um, unfortunately, even in the Netherlands, where we are based, we're seeing discussions that the Ministry of Justice would like to weaken encryption because they say they have trouble tracking criminals without seeing that actually there would be many more criminals and there would be many more victims of those criminals if people couldn't use cryptography. So, well, big plea to keep crypto safe, to use crypto. We still have a little bit coming up. We're going to look into some small details about attacks on the curves. And then we're going to go, as I announced already here, into pairings and postbox.